and welcome to A Critical Dragon, where I talk about narrative in film, television, and in books. And today I'm going to be talking about the prologue of House of Chains, book four of Stephen Erickson's The Malazan Book of the Fallen. Um, as is my want and has become tradition, I'm going to talk about the prologues. The reason I talk about prologues, number one, density of information. This is setting the scene for a novel. Quite often authors pack a lot more information, a lot more complex information into a prologue than they do as the book sort of travels on. Number two, prologues quite often sort of set the scene for what's going to be happening in the book. And number three, it doesn't spoil the book for anyone. So, you know, people can watch this when they get up to the, um, the, the other books. This doesn't give away anything about the novel. So, you know, that's why I do it. That's why I'm looking at prologues. But I wanted to look at this one and uh, probably do a couple of videos on this. There's enough here to be talking about. So the first thing, Burge of the Nascent, the 943rd day of the search, burn sleep. So first thing to note, we're not given an exact date. So the author is not letting us know, Erickson is not letting us know when this occurs, that the timestamp for it is something that is very localized, very specific to someone, day of the search. This is not a standard date. This is something that is going to be associated with some sort of quest, something so important that people actually, for what is that, 943 days, like over two and a half years, have been doing this thing. This thing is so important that they actually note the number of days of this as an important sort of date mechanism. Uh, the second thing to point out, verge of the nascent. So what is nascent? It's a proper noun here, it's capitalized, so it's obviously a place, but what does nascent mean? Um, something that is becoming, has the potential to become, and it's verge. So verge, again, we have a, a nice double meaning here in the verge on the boundary of, the, the boundary of something, the verge. So if you think on a road, there's the verge, it's the side of the road. So we're talking about a border, a boundary but also verge as in the, the way to describe, I am on the verge of becoming, I am nearly becoming, I am on the verge of being promoted, I am on the, the verge of ascending, that moment just before. So verge of the nascent is doubling down on this meaning of potentiality, um, of something that is in between, that is not quite developed yet, but is going to or has the potential to. So I think that's really interesting just, and again, in these couple of words, because of how the place has been named, how we're given this information, it, it gives us this subconscious way to approach what's in the text. So then let's go through the, the first couple of paragraphs here. Gray, bloated and pocked, the bodies lined the silt-laden shoreline for as far as the eye could see. So again, thinking back to all those other prologues, thinking back to the, the symbols that we have seen in the series thus far, we are again getting this sort of horrific, visceral, uh, disturbing image of bodies, of corpses. We don't know what these bodies are, but they are gray, they're bloated and pocked. So bloated is again, if you think back to dead house gates, this idea of the gases or it's absorbed things, it's been there for a while. These are not fresh bodies, they've been there for a while. And the bodies lined the silt laden shoreline. So look at the repetition, not only of the, the L sound in that alliteration, lined, laden, shoreline, line, but the repetition of line, so again, we talked about verge of the nascent. We have talked about bodies lining and shoreline. So you could say, oh, well, you know, Erickson couldn't think of any other words. If you've gotten this far in the series, you know that the, Erickson knows a lot of words for a lot of different things. Sometimes it's handy having a dictionary nearby. So the repetition of 
outlined, would suggest then that it's deliberate. So it's emphasizing this idea of a border, this idea of a, a transitional or liminal space between two things. Um, so these bodies, and there's a lot of them because as far as the eye could see. So if you think we've gone from a weather vane, a couple of dead or dying animals, to the three um, Ranag, to now potentially thousands of bodies. There's an escalation, there's a, an increase. So I'm not saying that that is particularly suggestive of anything just yet, but to bear in mind, there is this increase, there is this development over time as these symbols become used more often, more frequently, and we start seeing more of them and paying attention to them. Um, they are heaped like driftwood by the rising water, bobbing and rolling on the edges, the putrefying flesh seethed with black-shelled, ten-legged crabs. Weirdly enough, when I see ten-legged crabs, I always go, no, crabs have eight legs, because they have eight legs and two pincers. So I am having this weird moment where I'm looking at ten-legged crabs, and I go, is that ten legs and two pincers? So weird alien creature, or is it a way just of describing a normal crab? But it sticks out in my brain as this weird thing to try and wrap my head around. Um, but let's have a look at this. So we started with these bodies are lining, then they are heaped. So lining, you get a sense of flatness. Heaped, it is being stacked, it's rising. So this is another one of these things just to pay attention um, to the direction that language is taking or indicating. Uh, silt laden shoreline, flat. Bodies lined, flat. Heaped, three dimensional. It's you're, you're getting into a pile of something. And they're heaped like driftwood by the rising water. So again, we're getting a sense of upward movement. And then that is neatly contrasted with bobbing and up and down movement and rolling on the edges. So even though this seems like a very static image, we're looking out over a scene, there's movement contained within the description. And I, I've talked about this before. When you have description, by putting in these sort of active ways of describing it, it makes the description more lively. Um, bobbing, so moving up and down. So we had the rising water. So again, this idea of going up, but rolling on the edges. So looking back at that first sentence, lined, shoreline, um, and now we have edges. So we had the verge of the nascent, we had the shoreline, and now we have edges. So just in those two sentences, this idea of a border, this idea of the space between two definite things has been emphasized yet again. And the other weird thing, the reason edges sticks out to me, the reason my eye catches on it, is rolling on the edges. So rolling, you associate, you know, this movement round and round, smooth, but things typically don't roll on their edges. You, you get a sense from rolling of roundness but edges, you think of, that's what stops rolling. It's, it's a weird juxtaposition. It's a weird contrast. But you know that rolling on the edges is the bodies are rolling on the edge of the water. This makes perfect logical sense within the syntax of the sentence, within the grammar, within the structure um, of how Erickson has laid this out. But because it's the phrase rolling on the edges, we get this little snag in the back of our mind of things don't roll on their edge kind of feeling. The putrefying flesh, again, putrefying instead of putrefied. So it's, um, it's an ongoing process, making it more uh, active than simple past tense. But putrefying flesh, We've seen this before. We've seen this in Deadhouse Gates prologue. So we should be, or 
you know, we could be attuned to looking out for these things and thinking then, because this is going on, what is this potentially going to signify? Because at the minute, we don't have context. This is just description. We have no context for this. But this, I would argue, is an image then that should go to the back of your head, link to all those other descriptions and go, he's used this as a symbol before. What potentially is he using it as a symbol for now? And then we have the black shelled 10 legged crabs. Talked about the crabs. Um, black shelled. So in terms of color, we've gone gray, silt laden, um, silt, you know, it's hard to tell what color silt is going to be. It's going to depend on what the, the ground is, but the water isn't clear. The water isn't crystal clear. It's not one of those, I am on a beautiful sandy white beach and the, the aquamarine or the turquoise water that's crystal clear and I can see the tropical fish. That is not what we are seeing here. We are seeing something that is murky, that is opaque or potentially translucent. Um, but it's not transparent. And that's, I think, what's coming across. We don't know quite how opaque or translucent the water is, but that's what we're getting a sense of because it is silt laden. Black, again, one of these monochrome colors. Uh, the coin sized creatures had scarcely begun to make inroads on the bounteous feast the Warren's Sundering had laid before them. So, Here's an interesting sentence to end off the paragraph. Why is this interesting? Well, number one, uh, we suddenly get this idea of a warren that has been sundered and had created some aspect of this. We don't know how, but the bounteous feast, the warren sundering had laid before them. So something about this warren being ripped and torn or sundered. And we've seen warrens with these wounds before. In Memories of Ice Prologue, we saw this. Um, we've seen people traveling through tears and rips and sunderings of Warrens. We've seen the episode on the Salanda in Dead House Gates, where an imas went up into a rift, a tear, a sundering of a Warren. So again, we're getting a repetition of something that we have seen before. And we're getting a, a real sense that something has happened here that has led to this devastation. And these coin sized creatures, these crabs, are eating these bodies. So the bodies are the bounteous feast that were created by the worn sundering. The sundering obviously had a devastating impact on the local population. That it, for some reason, this cataclysm has resulted in all these dead bodies. And that is what you're getting from the very first paragraph. Now, another thing to point out here. So we've talked about this idea of a liminal space, a transitionary space, a boundary, the space between. And all of the images are pretty much natural images. Um, because even bodies, you know, bodies are natural. Shoreline, natural. Silt, natural. Um, driftwood, natural. Water, natural. Crabs, natural. But they're described as coin-sized. Coins are not natural. So coins are man-made. They're manufactured. They're not, um, not a naturally occurring resource. Unfortunately, we cannot have a coin tree as much as I've tried. And this sense of the artificial, the manufactured, impacting on this scene, intruding on this scene, is then emphasized by the word inroads. Yes, it is describing a movement of forward progress, of uh, methodical um, moving forward. But it's the word roads. Roads are not naturally occurring. Roads don't naturally occur. Paths can naturally occur, but roads don't. Roads are artificial, roads are man-made. So we have this very strange, in this last bit, of this artificiality 
creeping in, invading the uh, natural. And then we hear about the warren sundering. And so if a warren has sundered, it is suggestive then of some sort of invasion or intrusion. Second paragraph, the sky mirrored the low sky's hue, dull patched pewter above and below, broken only by the deeper gray of silts, and 30 strokes of the oar distant, the smeared ochre tones of the barely visible upper levels of a city's inundated buildings. So before moving on to the end of it, let's unpack this starting bit. The sea mirrored the low sky's hue. So we've gone from gray um, this silt laden sense of opaqueness or um, translucency to the sea mirrored. And of course, when we think of mirroring, we're thinking of very clear visuals, the low sky's hue. So we have the sea forming a base layer. The sky has been brought down to that is the low sky. So it's this feeling of compression. And again, we're looking at that space, the sea mirrored the low sky's hue. We're looking at that space between the sea and the sky. Again, another border area, another liminal area, another transitional space. But we then get the description of what this hue is, what this color is, and it's dull patched pewter above and below. So again, a monochrome and where mirroring tends to be about reflection and sharpness and clarity, we're told that this is dull patched pewter. And it's not even a shiny, it's not a shiny pewter, it's a patched pewter and it is dull. So we're getting the gray bodies, the silt, uh, making the water opaque or, or translucent, the, uh, the mirroring that's going on is actually of a dull gray color and it's patched pewter, which again sort of consolidates and supports this idea of the rotting of um, the putrefying flesh. It's a creepy image, I know, but patched pewter, it's not new. It's aged, it's worn. And again, like think back to Gardens of the Moon when we talked about the, the weather vane. And it was, uh, so this, this dull pewter of above and below where the, the sky and the sea are the same. So this idea of the liminal space that we're looking at, but it makes no difference because everything is this sort of gray color. It's not black, it's not white. It's not bright, it's not dark. It's in that gray in between. And it's broken only by the deeper gray of silt. So now we know that the silt laden shoreline, the shoreline is gray. Any bit of the shore that you can see is gray. The water is gray because it's full of silt and silt laden. So it's gray. The sky is gray. Everything is gray. Apart, the bodies are gray. But the things that aren't gray. We have black crabs. So they're still part of that spectrum, but they're not gray. And then the smeared ochre tones of the barely visible um, inundated buildings. So we get a sense that this water has drowned buildings. So the water is it's being implied because you don't typically go and build a whole lot of buildings out in the middle of the water. So it's implying, although it has not outright stated it, that the water has come in and drowned a city or a village. And the city or village had ochre colored buildings. So again, going back to what I was saying about in the first paragraph, the man-made, the constructed, the civilized, um, invading a natural scene. And here we have, everything is gray apart from the man-made buildings, which are ochre. And by the way, if you're playing the drinking game, ochre, take a shot. Um, so the upper levels of the city are sticking out. So this water, it, it's not hugely deep, but it's not that you can just sort of wade through it. It's not, 
not knee deep. It's deep enough to have drowned buildings. And again, we have uh, to support this idea. The distance is measured in 30 strokes of the ore. Um, so that's how are you measuring distance? Um, the number of ore strokes, kayaks, canoes, rafts, all of these things that you would use an oar with, a boat, all man-made. Uh, or, sorry, I should say artificial, uh, signs of, of uh, being created, crafted. And we're then given a, a distance between the shoreline and where the city is, and it's the distance of 30 oar strokes. What is that distance? No idea, because what size of oar, what size of boat? But the other thing that's actually really interesting about this, and again, going back to this idea of having active descriptions, 30 strokes of the oar. So there's a sense of movement because you get in that description that an oar is going in and out of the water and it creates almost the sound of a paddle going into the water and you get that slight splashing noise and will also disturb the water it is the intrusion of a blade into the water so again we're getting this idea of a border area of intrusion of uh, elements of civilization being part of that intrusion that they are out of place. And this is all done very, very simply in the language choices. And the ochre tones, because they contrast so sharply with the monochrome of everything else, serve two purposes. Number one, it makes uh, that image of the building stand out, that this is something important. This is something to remember that there, there were buildings here but also it emphasizes how everything else is gray, everything apart from that. Well, when I say gray, obviously the, the little crabs are, are black, but monochrome, but it's emphasizing that the only thing of any real color is the thing that has been drawn. And then we're told the storms had passed, the waters were calm amidst the wreckage of a drowned world. So, linking back then, the Warren Sundering had created this point D, and now we have the wreckage of a drowned world. What has been wrecked? The city. So, the Sundering of the Warren had created this flood that drowned the world. This is not a natural water. Um, and then have a look at the juxtaposition. The storms has storms had passed the waters were calm so of course when we think storm active fury but it had passed this is the the aftermath the waters were calm so this idea of everything is calmed down it's static it's peaceful amidst the wreckage and again wreckage is all about destruction of a drowned world past tense this world has drowned it's now dead so again we have this movement backwards and forwards to create an impression of this landscape that is far more interesting than, well, at least to me, is far more interesting to me than uh, there was a silty lake that had drowned the city and all the city's inhabitants had washed up on the shore. You know, Erickson didn't need to spend this long on description. So we look at why did he spend this long in the description? And this is where we get into this idea of building symbols, building metaphors, building themes, things that are going to connect. And again, everything that we've just kind of discussed fits into the name of this location, the verge of the nascent, this idea of a transitional space, a liminal space, a borderland that has a potential of becoming. Um, so I've probably talked long enough about those two paragraphs, um, and I think there's enough there to sort of round out this video. Um, but I will, I'll do a follow-up video and we'll go through a bit more.
um, to try and tease out some additional meaning, some additional things that are happening. So I hope you enjoyed this and I'll see you in the next one.